Today's Tuesday, November 15th, and that must mean that you're going to get another shitty episode of the news. Yeah, the previous seven days we've seen political turmoil, mass hysteria, shootings, stabbings, looting, burning. Well, you can only be talking about the Dishonored 2 launch from Bethesda, right? It was terrible. It was a disaster. Just an absolute disaster of a game launch. We're oh. going to cover that at the end. First, news about us. Oh, we got a store. If you want to buy stuff in the store, that's great. We got t-shirts and uh, hoodies and some other stuff. It's great. If you want to support us that way, you totally can. We've still got the Patreon, of course. And that's all we're going to say about that. It's fine. Now we've got some corrections from last week, as always. I have a feeling this is going to be a regular thing. We're always getting something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to own up to it. Uh, I'm, I mentioned that the Mounties were responsible for some, for some of the spying. That was not the case. There was an alphabet agency. You know, that was but, a, the Canadian story about uh, yeah. some law agency that was spying on journalists improperly. Right. And uh, although, uh, you know, you, we mentioned the thing about uh, lying being a muscle that can be developed and it gets easier. And we got a shout out to one commenter. <laughs> we wondered what that would be called. And this, this guy came up, if it's Canadians, it's got to be called moosing. Yes. So moosing, <laughs> moosing is the, uh, the act of... Uh, Getting, you know, making it easier and easier to make more ridiculous lies, I guess, if you're Canadian. Well, I think surveillance in particular. <laughs> if, if you're getting more and more comfortable with surveillance, you're moosing. So what we're saying is that we hope that the Mounties never get to a point where they're comfortable with moosing. But shame <laughs> on the other, <laughs> shame on the other agency <laughs> for moosing, I guess, is what we're saying. <laughs> We're already off the rails. We're not even we're not even two minutes into this thing, and we're already off the rails. This I think, is just. I think we might just need to uninstall the rails. <laughs> you know, another theme from we've got some follow ups for other stories, right. and the first one is about the war on cash. Uh, India's ban on currencies negatively impacting the poor. They they banned the five thousand and one thousand um, denomination currencies. Yeah, and they did it abruptly. They had like twenty four hours. Uh, now. You don't. You can still determine at banks after that time period. You just can't transact them. Mm. But there are huge lines, and this is really disrupting people's lives. And this is interesting to note. Even though the U.S. equivalent value, I think, is seven and fifteen dollars, these are the two largest denominations. So you can imagine mm. in India right now, they're settling all cash transactions for less than seven U.S. dollars wow. per bill. Now the reason that the uh, or the reason that the establishment there gave for doing this was to get a handle on um, tax transactions that were occurring without any kind of tax consequences, business transactions, and things like that. But the stories that are coming in are all about this mainly affecting the poor, and so that you know poorer people are having to stand in line forever at ATMs to get out their to get out their their money or to deposit their money and then get out smaller bills. But it seems like even with those relatively small amounts. You know, I guess the next lowest amount from 500 would be, what, 250, which would be, what, about 350? That would be a, a tiny amount. And, of course... About 350. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, the, their economy, I'm sure things are much cheaper. It's not as dramatic as, as we're thinking in terms of American dollars. But you, you have to go back. You know, they say it's we're combating corruption and black market and whatever, but... I, a lot of people are going to be scared by this. They're going to be so inconvenienced by this. They're going to be like, okay, I'm going to take steps to not use yeah. cash anymore. And the problem with that is now every transaction is recorded. The government sees it. They can track what's happening. They can cut you off if they don't like you. Uh, so it, it's it's scary even if it is well intentioned, as many government things <laughs> was it to was be. it well intentioned though? I, I mean. don't know, probably not. But even <laughs> if it was, even if it was totally innocent and well meaning, it has repercussions that we have to worry about. A cash free society is a step in the wrong direction. Yeah, it definitely has not worked out. There were there were the news story has uh, information about a guy paying his hospital bill in coins. He, he had dengue fever or something, and he paid his hospital bill. Uh, forty thousand rupees in, in, in bills <laughs> and coins. Forty thousand. Just wow. It's just you know, it's like here's my you know, it's like Scrooge McDuck. It's like here you go. Here's all my you know. I'm, I'm glad that I got dengue fever and can afford to pay it. I guess. You know, there's so. there was that guy that tried to pay his taxes in pennies and they wouldn't let him. <laughs> that was too inconvenient. <laughs> well, he better not move to India. That would be bad. <laughs> 
yeah, just, I don't know. I, we're, if you're experiencing this, if anybody in the audience is experiencing this, let us know uh, what you're experiencing from a first person point of view. We're really curious to know because I mean, I know that culturally things are a lot different in India than they are here in America, but I would just, we'd, we'd be really curious for your perspective. Make an account on the forum and let us know. Also in a follow up, <laughs> another follow up story. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, I think the, the first news story we ever did, we talked about how Facebook was targeting ads by race. You know, we got some feedback on this that people, they didn't think anything was wrong with it. But let's just reiterate, the problem here wasn't necessarily that they were showing races certain ads. It was that without you providing, you're not, you're not self-identifying here. No. They're categorizing you as a race based on the pictures you upload and the things that you look at and like. <laughs> and that's the issue. Well, they're going to do away with it. Clearly, this inner city youth is not interested in my rice cooker. <laughs> Clearly, I do not <laughs> yeah. want to waste advertising dollars on that. So internally, they claimed they decided it was a bad idea and they were probably going to get rid of it all along, but they were also <laughs> sued a couple of times. <laughs> Those lawsuits, man, it's like, oh, was that wrong? Should we not have done that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, and, sh we, sh we shouldn't have done that. And these lawsuits, you know, they might be a little bit frivolous. It's hard to argue if you have a little bit of a libertarian bent like I do that <laughs> Facebook doing this entitles you to money. But they're using the uh, federal uh, equal housing Act and the uh, Civil Rights Act as the bedrock for this case, which sounds really bad, even if it might not be really bad. And Facebook will probably settle this. Yeah, we in America have not had the best history with regard to race. <laughs> uh, in the past week, race has been a bit of an incendiary issue. <laughs> so we've got to be really careful with this kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's not... It's not that I want to encourage a lawsuit either, but at the same time, it's like I really have to question. I really want those developer memos. Honestly, just yeah. just just the middle manager talking to the programmers, explaining this pro this problem to a programmer and how it gets implemented in software. I think that that's just going to be comedy gold. And if those are ever leaked, it's just going to be so much fun. We're going to laugh about it, even though it's a very serious issue and no one should laugh about it. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think we talked about this last time. I want to see the variable names in those classes. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, you can, you can it's, it's BS, all, it's, you know, what do they call them? Ethnic affinity. Uh, ethnic, ethnic it's ethnic affinity. affinity all the way down to, like, we have to assign a variable here. <laughs> what do we call it? And I want to see that so bad. <laughs> I actually found a bug in a compiler once using really long variable names, so it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. <laughs> Speaking of uh, variable names that are, you know, buffer overruns and other memory type problems, there's a PwnFest competition that goes on, and pretty much everybody won or lost, depending on how you look at it, at PwnFest. Yeah, it's uh, literally every major corporation had total failure at this Pone Fest. And, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a good thing, you know, they're getting their money's worth here. They're they're finding their flaws, but it's it's amazing how it's like, okay, these are the products we're about to put out. And it's like, oh, look, <laughs> we can compromise every single one of them in short amounts of time. These are the products we're about to put out or the products that we have, in fact, already put out. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Pixel. Are in the millions and millions of hands and, and that kind of thing. The, the first device that we'll talk about that failed was the Google Pixel. It was pwned in 60 seconds or less or your Pixel's free. <laughs> <laughs> this is a now what, what do we mean you know if, you, if you've never heard of this kind of thing it's really an interesting situation that has evolved so uh, you know an, an event like Pwned Fest I mean what, what the hell that doesn't sound very professional it doesn't sound like anything at all well it's an event where companies like Microsoft and Google and Apple uh, even Apple uh, I think Apple's getting into the game although Apple was kind of a late comer don't, don't quote me on that but I'm pretty sure that Apple's even involved in this kind of stuff now but it's like Microsoft and Google will pony up you know $150,000 $170,000 to security researchers to find security flaws in their products. And that sounds like really good money, but it's actually terrible because if these companies had to pay their own internal security teams to do this kind of research, they're going to be paying millions of dollars in, you know, HR costs alone. And a lot of these security researchers are very, very gifted people. Some of them may have idiosyncratic tendencies. Some of them may do their best work, you know, in an abandoned subway station or something equally hacker movie cliche like you would see on, on TV or Mr. Robot or, you know, whatever movie. And so they can come out of their caves and do this work and then go back to their caves and it's completely fine. Sometimes they're part of uh, Chinese research organizations, which are government funded. 
sometimes they're uh, you know part of Mossad, <laughs> as has happened in the past. Um, but in this case, uh, there was a Chinese team that uh, you know took home the gold in in the Google Pixel phoning contest. Basically, the Pixel went to a rogue web page. Not only did they get control of the phone through the application, they were also able to uh, get full remote root access on the phone. And it was not through the the cow vulnerability that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. There's a second root exploit for the Google phone, or the Android, I guess, that they got through this. So that's sort of disturbing and kind of ex and interesting and exciting. Yeah, but as we said before, if you're on Team Microsoft or Team Apple and you are you got that smug grin on your face right now... Not so the, fast. You're in the exact same boat. <laughs> Safari, yes. Yeah, so if you were using Safari on Mac OS Sierra, the newest version, uh, somebody figured out a way to get root access through Safari. So yeah, just browsing the wrong web page and somebody's got remote root on your computer. That's probably bad. It does look like Apple's paying a little less. 80 grand versus 160. That's uh... <laughs> That's Apple. Yeah. You know, they've got the giant cash war chest, but they're, they're shortchanging everybody, even the security researchers. <laughs> so if you, if you hack <laughs> Apple stuff, maybe don't sell it directly to them. Maybe we wait and sell it to the NSA. You'll get a lot more. <laughs> or the FBI or... Yeah. Or Mossad, or you know, whoever. <laughs> it's fine. Sell it all. Of them. <laughs> they'll probably get you protection for life too, and or indentured <laughs> servitude, depending or, on how you look at that. Or they'll kill you. <laughs> you know, it could go either way. <laughs> it's like the XKCD comic where it's like, oh my God, he's got you know plausible deniability encryption. It's like I'll just get the wrench. It'll be fine. <laughs> it's like the rubber hose or whatever. It's, it's like that's how that really works, guys. Come on. Um, Edge was also. Um, one of the first ones to fail uh, as well. It failed in apparently 18 seconds. Now, the Edge vulnerability uh, is really interesting. Edge is Microsoft's new, uh, new browser. It also provided remote root access, uh, the equivalent uh, you know, Windows system uh, privilege. But the way that it did it was through uh, Win32, uh, Win32K. It's a kernel functions um, that the browser uses to do low-level things like draw a button. Yeah. And other browsers know not to trust this. Yes. To, so, so it's only, you know, it's, it's Microsoft hubris. It's like, oh, we don't <laughs> need to sandbox our browser because our, our OS is perfect. <laughs> well, the, the browser does have a lot of sandboxing, but for specific kernel calls, they figure that there's no possible way that these specific kernel calls are not super hardened against malicious applications. But the researchers actually found that um, specific calls to the Windows 32 kernel, or the Windows 32 kernel subsystem, I guess, um, was not actually properly sandboxed and properly sanitized. Um, Google Chrome, by contrast, suffered from a very, very similar vulnerability, but because Google Chrome does not trust the inputs and outputs from the Win32K subsystem, Chrome actually mitigated this vulnerability, which I thought was really interesting. You know who the other kind of attendees are at these events? Law enforcement agencies. We're not joking about that. In this case, the FBI, not at this event, but at a, at a prior event, had used malware like a grenade on Tor mail users. Yeah, this is a, an amazing story where it shows that it's the problem with the justice system not understanding technology. Nope. And this is a, a critical issue of yep. our time. And I don't know if it's ever going to be you know, you're always going to get judges who are older mm -hmm. and probably not super tied into technology. Maybe it'll get better with time, but technology always moves faster. Yep. Then. So what happened here is they were granted permission to target specific. A, a specific list of Tor mail addresses. Mm -hmm. And these were suspected uh, child porn traffickers. This is the other problem with a story like this. You can, you can get away with almost anything if you tell them, hey, we were going after child porn because no one can support child porn. But what they did, instead of going after these people, they installed the malware at the login screen before the user had ever identified themselves. So mm -hmm. everybody who used Tor mail was infected with FBI malware that was supposed to track like 300 individuals. Yeah, this is a problem. This is a problem because the justice system will never catch up to the people that improperly executed um, on, on this warrant, on the, on the warrant that they got to be able to target these specific 300 people. Clearly, if they're on the login screen, you know, however this exploit works, you know, even before somebody hits the submit button, I would be okay with it if it's like when username equals bad guy 37, right. then the malware fires. I would be okay with that. I would be completely okay with that. The problem here is that 
you know, when it's convenient, it seems like these people wield technology like a blunt instrument, and then they're like, oh, is that wrong? Should we not have done that? And then other times they're using these bleeding edge, you know, remote root exploits uh, with surgical precision. And so the, the dichotomy between sort of ham-fisted, just bang on it with a hammer until something falls out, and, you know, you know, surgical precision when the situation calls for it, it seems like a dishonest approach to sort of legitimate law enforcement. And depending on who's in power, you never know how that's gonna be abused. You never know when these agencies will be called upon to use their tools um, for malicious purposes. And if you think about the highest echelons of power, do you think any of them understand Tor Mill? No. No. <laughs> do any of them understand the technology that they're using to exploit this. I mean, we saw that with the whole Probably Apple not. Apple yeah. encryption backdoor keys. It's like, we just need a universal key. It's fine. It's like, you don't understand Pandora's box that you're going to open with that. You just don't. Now, the guys who built this software, they know. They understand, they obviously. They have a high level of understanding. They're building malware to get around it. But in their minds, it seems to be that if you are trying to hide from them, you are guilty of something. That seems to be their, <laughs> their, you know, their way of thinking, their MO. I might not be guilty of anything today, but I might be guilty of something tomorrow yeah. retroactively. Right. And that's, that's something everybody should be afraid of. We have, we have but only to read our relatively recent past as a, as a species in all different countries around the world to know that that's true. We can't, you know, we, as a society, we can never forget that. It's just dangerous. It's bad. So, eh. In other funny news, uh, researchers have hacked the Philips Hue smart bulbs from a drone. This is a great hack. <laughs> a little tongue in cheek because the way they hacked them, they made them blink SOS <laughs> in an irreversible way. You can never <laughs> fix your light bulbs after this. <laughs> well, so, sometimes you've got to get the SOS out any way that you can. <laughs> <laughs> The great thing about this hack, it was done from a thousand feet away. Yep. With a drone. With a drone. So you're not going to avoid it, you know. <laughs> and the only way to undo it is to take the light bulb apart, which, you know, <laughs> nobody's going to do that. <laughs> Sounds like that's the Internet of Things behaving badly yet again. Ah, uh, the Internet of Things. <laughs> Since we've been doing this, we have not had a week where the Internet of Things weighed heavily on more than one story. There's a great Twitter uh, that everybody should follow called Internet of Shit. <laughs> and it's amazing because every time there's a story that comes out, it just tweets and it's like, here I am. You can't forget about me. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a, uh, a sewage treatment plant that gets DDoSed or something that we're literally going to have the Internet of Shit. <laughs> In Finland, uh, the Internet of Things is to blame for you not having heat. If you haven't had heat the last couple of weeks in Finland, you can blame the Internet of Shit. Can you imagine... You're the person on the other end of that phone that has to explain <laughs> to the dentist. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Have you tried turning it off and on? Wait, what now? I can't. Why well, here's not working because of the internet? I, I'm sorry. Explain that to me. <laughs> so the, the deal with these heating systems being on the internet in the first place makes no sense at all. But we'll explain the reasoning yeah. at the time, uh, which is basically remote control. It's basically a, a quote unquote cost saving measure. Yeah, it, we actually had this uh, in our high school. It's very prevalent in big institutional buildings. They are controlled from a centralized source rather than letting the occupants of the building control them individually as a money-saving tactic. <laughs> yeah, so think about this. You, you're thinking about you know, your typical you know, large high school, a whole bunch of classrooms, tens of thousands of square feet. And the difference between 68 degrees internally and 72 degrees internally is probably about four to $10,000 a year in heating costs for that building. Now, imagine you're a school district and you've got you know 10 buildings like this or 20 buildings or whatever. Suddenly that savings is really, really significant on heating costs. And so how do you control the thermostat? Well, you put it on the internet, so you've got a control panel. You just you know sit down in your ivory tower somewhere at the, at the school board office and you're like, no, let's make it 67 and a half degrees. <laughs> now, the attackers didn't do anything as fancy as get control of that and you know <laughs> turn the temperature down to zero all they did was just DDoS it and I think was this Mirai yes yeah yes. the Mirai you know still going strong still growing uh, and all they did was DDoS Thanks, it. Shit. these systems were built so that if they couldn't call home in a certain amount of time they would simply reboot and yep. that's a lengthy process you know it's a big heating system and so it's been rebooting for a couple of weeks yep 
So if you don't have heat in Finland, you now know why. You can blame the internet of shit and somebody else's security <laughs> cameras. <laughs> or toasters or smart TVs. or What a know. world we live in when a nanny cam in Sacramento can freeze a person in Finland to death. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, the main target now, however, is not heating systems in Finland. It's actually Russian banks. Yeah, the Russian banks are the most recent recipient of the Mirai <laughs> hug of death. <laughs> it's a really just <laughs> <laughs> hug of death. <laughs> they haven't given us much information because when something goes wrong at the bank, they don't give you information. They just say, it's fine, don't worry about it. The ATMs will be back online when we tell you they'll be back online. <laughs> but uh, the major banks in Russia, some of the biggest, are completely shut down. Now, this is a really interesting contrast. Uh, most banks here in America are actually connected on a private network, not the internet. And then that network gets on the internet at a few very, very specific choke points. So yeah. something like this targeting American banks, it would prevent the banks from getting on the internet, but they'll still be able to service transactions and, and do that sort of thing. Yeah, we have a system called SWIFT, which settles all the transactions for entered banking. And uh, there are very few countries you know, there's a reason there's a lot of political tension between Russia and the West, and that's because they don't play ball with the banking system. Mm -hmm. And so they're not on that system. They're probably just using the Internet to settle those kinds of things. I think there's talks of Russia and China, maybe Iran, building their own. I don't know if that's been done yet. But these settlement systems, they're not part of ours. So... This is probably what makes them vulnerable. That's what our suspicion is, because when we talk about the, uh, you know, the Finnish heating system sort of being a casualty of war <laughs> with this, it could be something as simple as the, 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 the heating system for those buildings in Finland uh, shares an IP address that's similar to or from, a, from the same subnet as the Russian banking system. And so because of that, uh, you're in a situation where uh, you're a casualty of war or a casualty of cyber, whatever the hell this is. And it's not really anything to do with DDoSing the heating system. It's to do with taking off, uh, taking offline all these different banks that are using a lot of different public IP addresses because they're not targeting one or two networks. They're targeting thousands of networks. And so if they've swept up some other people in, in the process, we talked last week about Liberia. You know, Liberia was the target last week. Maybe Liberia was just happened to be a country that had comparable Internet access to all of the banks of Russia. And it's like, well, we need an analog before we directly attack our target. Let's attack Liberia. Or maybe there was a political. We, we don't know. But there, there doesn't seem to be a pattern between Liberia and PayPal and, you know, some other banking DNS here in America and, you know, the presidential election and Putin. And I don't know, it just it's just all conspiracy theory, tinfoil hat nonsense. So none of it matters. But it's also it's like spam. It doesn't cost you anything to do it. <laughs> you know, just just do it. Just see what happens. So why not? Why not take Liberia offline? That would be know? a cool thing to have on your business card. I took Liberia offline. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, with that, we're going to talk about science now. Yeah, this is some kind of good news and for a change. We're going to put chips in primates' brains to make them walk again because they had spinal cord injuries. Yeah, this is really cool. So this is basically wireless transmission from the brain to the muscles that bypasses a severed spinal cord or otherwise, otherwise compromised <laughs> spinal cord. You know, the coolest thing about that is that sort of analog to digital conversion mm -hmm. of brain signals. That's really exciting. <laughs> it's also really exciting because it's another thing to be on the internet of things. <laughs> <laughs> Your legs. <laughs> Didn't we see this on Archer? I mean, didn't Krieger do this to the one guy and it's like his legs are remote controlled or something? You could just run up and punch somebody and blame it on the Russians. It was Putin. <laughs> we were talking earlier about the, uh, like a Manchurian candidate, like a Manchurian candidate yeah. remake for 2016. And it's like, it was my implants. Honest, Your Honor. It, it was is, my implants. It's scary. I mean, if, if you can broadcast the contents of the the monkey's brain to its lower spine, you could broadcast the contents of another <laughs> monkey's brain. Put them in VR and just, you know, have them walk around as this person. It's, it's a scary uh, Orwellian future that might 
be using this technology. I mean, clearly a lot of good is going to come out of this technology, and it's really great because it seems like we're just right on the precipice of, of being able to be in a situation where paralyzed people can walk again, and that's great. But at the same time, you know, if I'm ever in a horrible car wreck and I'm ever in a situation, I'm going to totally be looking at the brochure, and it's like, oh... Oh, this is WPA mm. encryption on this. Oh, <laughs> oh, can we switch to AES? I'm gonna need some AES encryption. Is there like an upgrade package? Do I have to pay somebody for that? This is not, this is not up to snuff. And you know, there's gonna be, especially in the early human trials, there's gonna be a caveat that you don't. It's only like the last page in tiny print. It's like all the telemetry is gonna be sent back to the lab, and people will be monitoring your motions <laughs> 24/7. <laughs> I was thinking about like going through the airport. It's like you go through the millimeter wave thing at the airport and all of a sudden you're kicking the shit out of the machine and it's like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Yeah, that could, be, that could be a big deal. Somebody in your office is microwaving a burrito and you just collapse on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how they would shield interference. <laughs> That would be interesting. There's going to be a lot of weird stuff going on if, when, when and if. I think if, or actually when is, is the actual, the, the real one. It's going to happen. It's going to be in humans. <laughs> and we're going to see some odd things happening. Speaking of people doing stuff to primate brains, what did the Army do to... Uh, <laughs> U.S. military successfully tests electrical brain stimulation to enhance staff skills. Yeah, this is... So apparently, this is a replacement <laughs> for drugs like uh, Adderall. And even caffeine, it just sharpens you up. You know, it just makes you, if you're performing a monotonous but uh, a focus-driven task like flying a drone, this apparently keeps you alert and going for a long time just with electrical impulses into the brain. So an electromagnetic pulse to the brain is almost kind of sort of like taking drugs for performance enhancement. Yeah, and the the real question is, when are we going to start seeing this in StarCraft? <laughs> This is going to be really amazing when they figure out how to disqualify StarCraft players. Maybe we, maybe we switch back to like CRT monitors. It's like the judge runs over and it's like, oh my God, there's all kinds of colored distortion on this CRT monitor from the electromagnetic field. What's going on? Oh, this guy is, you know, juicing, literally. <laughs> in in Counter-Strike, now, instead of accusing you of hacks, they're going to accuse you of juice. I can't really believe that this is a, uh, a successful, you know, there's, they successfully test the electrical brain. So it's like... Is the history of this classified? Can I do a freedom of information request? Because I'd like to know what the failures were that got us to this success. Because I guarantee you this was not the first test that was successful. I want to know about the failures and how long this has been going on. Well, they had to find the limits of, you know, I mean, how do you measure the dosage? They had to figure out what was too much. But the other thing is, this article mentions, there's not been long-term studies. So... You know, this, you can think back to like, well, this is kind of like uh, thalidomide. Hey, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this takes care of nausea perfectly. But there were some unintended consequences. <laughs> Oops. And <laughs> you got to wonder if, you know, 50 years from now, this is going to be the next Agent Orange where we're paying these poor people who had their brains scrambled a ton of taxpayer money because... We didn't wait to figure out what happens when you mess with their brains over a long period of time. Are you saying that Agent Orange is not part of a balanced diet? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, no, it's not, it's not what's for dinner. I really want to know about the failed experiments from this, because maybe this is what we've been up to at Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> all those terrorists are hyper alert. <laughs> They're just working crosswords all day. <laughs> Speaking of money misspent, let's talk about the Navy's long-range weapon that is too expensive for them to shoot. This is amazing. So we've got this new super ship, the Zumwalt, or Zumwalt class, I think. it's a. am not sure if that's the name of the ship or the class. But anyway, it's this new stealthy, super tech, futuristic ship. It doesn't show up on radar. It's amazing. And it's got these guns that shoot hundreds of rounds per minute. <laughs> and is insanely accurate and can just turn whole acres of land into a parking lot. The catch is it's $800,000 every time you pull the trigger. But it's so accurate, you can fire it less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, at pretty much a million per, I, I don't know what we would use this for. And neither does the Navy because we're not going to use it. <laughs> well, now, you were saying that the... Um 
the basic version of the shell, which is just ballistics, no guidance, no anything else, is about 7,000 around. I, I think it's about 7,000, and this is just the dumb, <laughs> you know. Explode on impact, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, shoot it and see where it lands and then adjust. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a there's sort of a middle of the road that does have guidance that's like 70 grand, but that's a big jump. And they describe this as being three times more lethal than traditional <laughs> ballistics. So for the difference between 7,000 and 800,000, you get three times more lethal. <laughs> uh, uh, it's too expensive to fire. I mean, it seems like the bean counters would have caught this before now, but uh, you know, we'll see. It has a cool name. It's L R L A P Lurlap. <laughs> it sounds like it has a learning disability. <laughs> <laughs> well, whoever decided to spend eight hundred thousand dollars per missile has a learning disability, I think. <laughs> In other science news, let's talk about the M drive. This one's really exciting because there have been a few little bits and pieces of M drive news uh, that came out in the last few months, and uh, it's it's really exciting to talk about the M drive. The M drive, if you haven't heard of it, is uh, microwave propulsion. It uh, basically, theoretically, would use microwave energy from a microwave emitter as a means of propelling a spacecraft. Now, it's a very, very low thrust, less thrust than an ion drive, um, but it converts electrical energy into physical thrust, or at least theoretically. Well, not even theoretically. Actually, theoretically, on paper, it totally doesn't do that. But experimentally, there have been some experimentalists that have said that it totally does. And so we've got a new article from Fiona McDonald on the 7th of November, 2016. It's like, oh, this leaked paper, totally, uh, she's a little late to the party. This is the same part, the, the same article from a year ago. And I wanna really, like, I wanna be there. I wanna support this. It's really great. But I've had some time to do some reading and some research on this, and there's not any new information here. This is not a new thing. This is not anything that's uh, beyond what we already have in terms of research or, or information that's out there. And based on the information that's out there, I don't see how the M drive could possibly work. Yeah, and it is a tiny, tiny amount of output, but you have to think of it in terms of space, this frictionless environment, where you just keep going faster and faster. You just do it really, really slowly. Yep. But you're always going faster and faster. And all you need is a solar panel to keep feeding this thing. So if it's real, Space travel can be done with no fuel at all, which is amazing. Yeah, the, the amazing thing with this is that it's um, better than a solar sail, uh, which uses the momentum of, of photons, I guess, to propel it forward, but it's still not quite as good as an ion drive. And an ion drive is continuous acceleration, and so even though it's not a lot of acceleration, a, a good ion drive has about as much acceleration as the weight of a sheet of paper pushing down on your hand in Earth's gravity. So not really a lot. So it's less acceleration than that, but more acceleration than a solar sail. But the bad news is that a lot of the math and physics that are behind this, it would require such a fundamental change in our understanding of physics that it seems exceedingly, exceedingly unlikely. There have been a few experiments like this, though, um, in the past where, you know, in the early 1920s, there were experiments where we hadn't worked out a few things, and it wasn't that math, the math required was fundamentally different. It's just that things were not completely worked out through the, you know, like the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s um, in the early 20th century. And so the more I look into the, the M drive, the more that I think that it's a situation like that where there's something going on here, but I think it's going to be accounted for um, in terms of classical equations. I, I don't see anything super extraordinary, uh, super extraordinary happening here. And I'm also somewhat disconcerted that Eagle Works is the one doing the research. Not that there's anything wrong with Eagle Works doing the research, but they're not, you know, like Richard Feynman experimental physicists. They're, they're more like experimentalists. And so that's not a good thing in terms of validating this thing in terms of, you know, being able to say, oh, yes, this thing actually totally does work. So I mention it just because it's like I'm keeping my eye on the stories. I totally want to report to you guys if something amazing happens. But the physics of this... Uh, is moving farther away from reality than getting closer to it, I'm sorry to say. You might see a couple of sites reporting this, but again, it is an old leak. There's nothing new. Not been peer-reviewed, and you really take it with a grain of salt. You definitely A very large grain of salt that you would probably get choked on. <laughs> but <laughs> don't let that, uh, you know, dissuade <laughs> your, your science curiosity because there are some fundamental physics that are in question this week. <laughs> the other really big science news from this week is, is gravity an emergent phenomenon? Yeah, I know, that's, this is not anything new, gravity and emergent phenomena. that's not a new argument, that's, that's also an old argument. 
But there's some new math for gravity as an emergent phenomenon, this time that revolves around gravity uh, being the result of storing information in space-time. So this is sort of an interesting situation if this is, uh, if, if, if this works out because the equations that this guy has come up with uh, basically resolves the need to have dark matter. Like dark matter doesn't need to enter into it. If gravity is the result of storing information in space-time at a quantum level, then you really don't need dark matter. And his uh, equations predict the motion of stars in the galaxy without having to have dark matter um, to account for the motion. So it's a really, it's a really interesting read. Uh, gravity as an emergent phenomenon is not a new concept, but the perhaps somewhat novel thing in this paper is that it's related to the storage of information. And that also explains a lot about, uh, potentially explains a lot about uh, black holes and some other things. And the, the, the one that I'm more familiar with is gravity as an emergent phenomenon in the realm of thermodynamics. So you get in a situation where when you start looking at a black hole and what a black hole you know, does to space and time around it, um, that you can actually take thermodynamics equations and run through them and eventually gravitation, gravitational equations will fall out of thermodynamics equations. And so this is really related to, you know, creating and destroying information the way that Hawking talks about it. And so as a result of creating and storing information, um, gravitation is an emergent phenomena there. And so this is perhaps interesting and something that we're going to keep a look at. And this is sort of a, a fun read because it talks a little bit about modified uh, Newtonian dynamics and, and the changes that would be needed there and how this is all a result of entropy and enthalpy. When we talk about information, and before Level one news was a thing. I remember we were talking about those uh, time crystals, <laughs> yeah, and how yeah. that dealt with information storage. You know, as as a, a physics thing, it makes you. It sort of supports the whole idea of living in a simulation. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about information being this fundamental storage block of the <laughs> universe. <laughs> That's terrifying. Well, and then you start to think about, you know, what if the uh, reference frames as described, you know, in Einstein, what if the reference frames are actually the universe compensating for complex render times? It's like when we're, when we're playing a game, because the game can't alter the passage of time, the number of frames per second drops to, you know, 20 frames per second. But that PC master race 60 FPS and above, uh, when you start encountering a black hole or when you start encountering something that requires a lot of information, the computer that is the universe has to slow you down. So you're still experiencing 60 FPS. The rest of the universe isn't. The rest of the universe is a reference frame. Totally is not uh, experiencing that. But from your perspective, you're slowing down so that you, you still experience 60 FPS in your time. But for everything else that the rest of the universe is doing, it's not 60 FPS. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a really clever problem to the FPS problem. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, you just altered the cosmological constant. It's fine. It's just not even a thing. <laughs> Switching gears a bit. Uh, the CBC has threatened podcast app makers arguing that RSS readers violate copyright. Ah, this is insane. Uh, and this is similar to uh, the argument that a lot of people are saying that, hey, Google, if you link to our news story, you owe us money. This is hard. <laughs> and in this case... The, Do you know how the internet works? The CBC <laughs> produces some podcasts. So they're saying that apps that consume their RSS and list their podcast is a copyright violation. No. Because those apps are infringing on that, co that <laughs> podcast. We included this mostly because Cory Doctorow wrote it. Because Cory Doctorow is a really smart guy. And he knows what he's talking about. But good lord... This kind of thing, I mean, I don't know, we need to come up with a new term like internet shaming or something, like when companies do something just so, <laughs> it's like they have to be shamed into behaving the right way. It's like, I know the money's on the line and I know that corporations are all about money, but no, they must be shamed into doing the right thing. And this goes back to what we were talking about before. The legal system doesn't understand this, clearly. Like, they, this, I can't think that if someone really understood what the situation was, they would try to make this argument. No. But they don't, and they don't care. They're just like, oh, your money's being threatened? We will sue. <laughs> I mean, the whole mechanism of RSS is designed around sharing. If you wanted people to jump through hoops before being able to download a version of your, of your podcast or whatever, 
you would just put a web form in front of it. Like go and you fill out your name and your email address. If that's what, you know, you're trading your name and your email address for the podcast or, you know, watch an ad and then get the podcast or, you know, whatever and get the podcast. You can set up a mechanism like that on the internet that doesn't require you to use RSS. As a result of using RSS, there is implicit permission there for you to download and consume that content like as if the standard was designed for. That doesn't mean that you have the rights to like incorporate it in your own works or anything like that because that's not what the technology was created for. The technology was created for distribution. And so it's distributing to you and the mechanism doesn't have any other specific requirements of use. And the argument that they're making is as simple as you clicking on the RSS, totally cool. An app doing it on your behalf, not allowed. So it's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't understand the internet. Can somebody <laughs> explain it to me? All right, Dishonored 2, finally. <laughs> Dishonored 2 launch has happened, and uh, it was a little bit of a debacle. The, the, uh, it's like 18 FPS if you've got you know, dual 1080s and 128 gigs of RAM. You, you're telling me that there's a AAA game launch that was a console port that isn't performing well? <laughs> <laughs> On a PC, how is this possible? I think this is the first time that's ever happened, isn't it? <laughs> you, think that, uh, you think that these companies are getting together and they're like, man, this PC master race thing is really out of hand. What we really need to do is make it to where you need a PC that's three times more powerful than a console <laughs> in order to keep everybody on console. I, don't, I mean, I don't think that's really what's happening, but you, know, you, know, you never know. I don't know, but uh, I, I, think, I think their thought process is as simple as this. These morons are going to keep pre-ordering no matter what we do. <laughs> and they're right. Yeah, don't pre-order. Pre-ordering's bad, okay? Yeah. Pre-ordering's very bad. It looks like it would be a lot of fun. but uh, Yeah, I think people are generally happy with the gameplay in the instances where they have the horsepower to run it. <laughs> Which is an entire gaggle of horses, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. In other gaming news, uh, Nintendo has launched the NES Classic. This is a miniature original Nintendo, if you're not familiar. It's one of the, one of the first, I would say, blockbuster, um, like, smash hit video game consoles. Yeah, and it's pure nostalgia. Because, pure nostalgia. you know, people our age, this is literally our childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eight, eight bits of glory. This thing comes with uh, 50 games. Uh, it's not upgradable. You can't change anything about it. it. Comes with a controller that's exactly like the original NES controller, which was terrible. Which was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Walmart and Amazon and a bunch of other places got it, but it pretty much all um, it pretty much all sold out immediately. So you know, it's not really a situation where um, Nintendo anticipated the demand. It's sixty bucks uh, American. Um, and I really don't think it's, it's that good of a deal. I mean, I really wanted to get one and play with it just because of nostalgia, but I have a hard time supporting Nintendo because they're very, very overly protective. They're overly attached to intellectual property. Yeah, we can't make any content showing you this thing because... <laughs> it's going to get flagged! They'll claim it yeah, it's, immediately. It's, it's going to totally get flagged. Uh, the best we can do is this. So if you manage to pick one up, be sure to put it on eBay because uh, your next exciting eBay item is here. Uh, you know, watch your bank account grow. This is great. I and love you, this. But you know, this isn't the only product that Nintendo's put out, and it's had a really limited run. And uh, what was the name of those little like action figures that interacted with the games? Uh, Amiibos or something. I remember those being the yeah. same situation. People were complaining. It's like they didn't make enough of these, and the, you know, and it sort of created its own little hype because. They were so hard to get, yeah. and Nintendo fans are so uh, hardcore and addicted to these things. So I think there might be a little bit of that here. It's like, you know what? These people are sick with nostalgia. They're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna love these. So sick we can with nostalgia. We can create a ton of hype. Now we would never suggest this because it's wrong <laughs> and you shouldn't do it. But a twenty-five dollar computer and an emulator will let you play ten thousand of those games instead of fifty. <laughs> This might be a, a convenient, easy way for me to get legal on all of my ROMs. I mean, I've got probably, uh, the ROMs that I have, I've got the cartridges for maybe 20 of them. But the other ones that I had as a kid, I don't know what happened to them. I think they just, like the closet monsters got them or something. This would be a really cheap way for me to get legal on the ROMs. But yeah, it's not anything we can ever, we can ever put online because Nintendo are, are real bastards about streaming and let's play and all that kind of stuff and so i can't support them as a company because of that you can also get a nice uh, usb version of that nintendo controller for probably about 30 bucks although i'll probably get one for christmas because that's that's usually what happens my friends are like god stop being such a pedantic <laughs> asshole here it's like okay well i mean i guess i could do that that's fine 
<laughs> well, that's it for the news this week. There's not really anything else to talk about. Uh, the store's yeah. still online. There's apparently. definitely nothing else that happened this past week that I can think of. Nothing else worth talking about. Certainly not. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week. See ya.